Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let us start off with a, a word of prayer. Our gracious Lord, we come before you this morning, and we ask us, we and we ask you to help us to see you, to help us to understand you, to help us to know who you are this morning and to worship you for it. You are a mighty, majestic, powerful God, full of glory, full of mercy, but you are the one who never changes. And Lord, as we seek to understand you this morning, we pray that you would be amongst our midst and that you would be our teacher. In this we pray, amen. When we turn through the pages of our Bibles, we are met again and again, example after example, with devout men and women who utterly adore and are captivated with God. There is a, a deep, a holy awe, a, a terrible reverence. God was there, their very life. Think of Say the devotion of somebody like a, like a David, just as an example. We see that he's utterly captivated by God at all times. Well, most times. But not only this, we also see entire communities with their lives revolving around God, with the worship of God. And especially in the Old Testament, you can't help but sometimes be impressed by the, the ceremony and the things that they would do in their worship. And all of these rituals would again and again point to the worship of God. Now this is not just true in the scriptures. We see this again and again throughout history. With different Christian communities. Living for God was everything for these people. Well, we must ask ourselves, why does things feel so different now? Why, why is it as in general we treat God so flippantly, so irreverently, may not even think of him on some days? We don't turn to him in prayer. We don't read the scriptures. And don't get me started about our further culture, who's completely turned their back. We may be tempted to say, well, that was then and this is now. It's a different time. People lived in a different way. But I tell you, it is not because we live in this secular age. It is not because it is a different time. Because the thing is, we see this happen occur throughout Scripture and throughout history time and time again. The waxing and waning of the worship of God. At one time, you have a people who are worshipping God as if their very lives depend on it. And then the next, we see a people who completely disregarded this God, who are very opposed to him. What this comes down to is an issue of knowing God, is an issue of the proper pursuit of knowing God. So last month, we started on a series on the attributes of God. We looked at the truth that God is just so big that we cannot truly comprehend him. We cannot truly understand who he is. But yet at the same time, he came down to our level and made himself known to us. And we see this especially true in the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We also considered some diagnostic questions, which I think would be important to keep in our mind as we go through today's message. Do you know God? What is he like? How well do you know God? Is he like us or is he completely different? Is your view of God the same as how God is described in the scriptures? I encourage you to keep these questions in mind as we dig into the immutability of God. So first, let's define what is meant by the immutability of God? 
We read in Psalm 102, verses 25 and 27. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Here we see the psalmist proclaim the excellent work of God, his magnificent creation. He writes how God, from long ago, created the heavens and the earth. Yet these things that we see that are so steadfast will wear away, wear away like a garment. So picture this illustration. Picture a piece, a piece of clothing. If you wear it from enough times, it becomes thin and thread uh, and threadbare. Holes start appearing in it. It becomes drab. If you wear it, it hangs off you, and eventually becomes no better than a rag, fit to be thrown away. All that is created, the earth, the heavens, all creatures, and that includes us by its very nature, are mutable, that is, subject to change. Starting with the fact that at some point we all came into being from non-being at some point. It was not, and then it became. And all will wear out. Think about how we change. First, we're conceived, we are born, we grow, we learn. Our emotions go up and down. We feel things differently from day to day. Sometimes we get sick. Sometimes we are healthy. We change our minds constantly. We die. Everything about us changes. Look at the creation. We see the plants, they bloom, they grow. From a seed comes a mighty tree, but they die too. We look at the sky, we see the sun, the moon, the stars. They dance across the sky. Yet even they will die. This is what the creation has to look forward to. Wearing away. But you see, the psalmist doesn't stop there. He then contrasts the creation with God. God does not need replacing. He does not become threadbare. He does not make holes in him he remains the same year after year millennia after millennia for all eternity god has always existed and this is something that the psalmist uses to rejoice in to find security and comfort in amongst affliction and this is something that we ourselves should root ourselves in when we are facing adversity that God does not change. This is what is called the immutability of God. If we were to give a, a short, precise definition, it means that God does not change in his essence, in his character, in his knowledge, or his will. Immutability is something that is very difficult to understand, very hard to comprehend. It's easy to say, easy to say that he does not change, but very hard to know. It is because this is something that uniquely belongs to God. It is his by nature, and we do not have other examples to compare to. No other being possesses immutability. Nothing does. Everything else, by its definition, changes. It's like the Trinity, for instance. We can give a, an accurate, simple definition of what the Trinity is. But none of us can truly understand what it means that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. That there are three gods in one person. Part of this is because God's unchanging nature is part of his eternality. For God alone possesses immortality. He's uncreated and has no beginning. And this uncreated nature, this unchangeable nature of God, means that God wants nor needs anything. He doesn't need anything at all. He does not have any new thoughts. He does not change his mind. He does not make new plans. God never has a plan B. 
and he doesn't pack up and leave to go to a different place. Ancient Greek poet Herodotus wrote this famous one. No man steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river and is not the same man. We are so used to everything around us changing, including ourselves. But you see, when God steps into that river, only the river changes around him. He remains the same. So in what ways we may think that God does not change? This morning we'll look at three main categories. His essence, his knowledge, and his will. Firstly, we'll consider his essence. That's, that's his being, his person, who he truly is, his attributes. God does not ever change in his fundamental being. Each and all of God's attributes do not change. They remain the same. For instance, consider his goodness and his love. In Isaiah 54.10, we read, For the mountains may depart and hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. We can lean on his goodness because it will not change when our lives get difficult, when things are hard, when it seems like God is absent, his goodness stands strong. We must learn patience and we must learn steadfastness. But in the light of those circumstances, we need to trust in the unchanging God. And now this is true of any of God's attributes. We could go through each of his attributes and show how they don't change. Whether that be his eternality, his power, holiness, mercy, perfection, his presence, or any of his attributes. None can grow greater. None can diminish. Puritan author Stephen Charnock put it this way. How cloudy would it be? How cloudy would his blessedness be if they were changeable? How dim his wisdom if it might be obscured, how feeble his power, if it were capable to be sickly and languish. How would mercy lose much of its luster if it could change into wrath, and justice much of its dread if it could be turned to mercy, while the object of justice remains unfit for mercy, and the one who has need of mercy continues only fit for divine fury. You see, God's immutability is the knot that ties all of God's attributes together. And we are to be moved in worship in all of God's unchanging attributes. Secondly, God's knowledge never changes. He never learns anything new. Nothing is surprising. He never forgets what he once knew. We read in Psalm 147, verse 5, Great is the Lord, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. His understanding is so great that he knows all things past, present, and future. He knows what will happen to the same degree that he knows what is happening and what has happened. There is no distinction for him. The single act of knowing means that he knows all things at once. There is no progressive of this, then this, then this. He just knows all. There is no learning, and this is a part of who God is. It is a part of his essence. In Romans 16, 27, he is called the only wise God. All treasure and wisdom is found in God. God's knowledge of us does not change as we change, as we grow, as we learn. God is not surprised about who we become. Before God, he sees all that we have been, all that we are, and all that we will be. This is such a contrast to us as, as mere creatures. We are constantly changing. We are learning. We are growing. There are things that we now know that we didn't. There are things that have been corrected. We've in the past known things that are false, and our knowledge has been corrected. There are things that we know now that are wrong. 
and hopefully we'll learn that. Now, the implications of if God did not possess this all-changing knowledge, it would be utterly catastrophic. What if God did not have all wisdom and, and knowledge? If he was not eternally wise, he would not be God. If he did not have all knowledge, he would not be completely wise. How could we trust him? His revelations, his scriptures, they'd be suspect. If he did not have all knowledge, the Bible couldn't properly be trusted. Maybe the words in that book are old and antiquated and we need to move up with the times. Maybe we need to take society's views on sexuality, marriage, the family structure. Because God just didn't know how things would happen. I mean, if God could change his knowledge, could change in his knowledge, how could we trust his promises? I mean, this has eternal consequences, brothers and sisters. We're not just trusting in God for superficial, temporal things of life. We're trusting in him in the eternal existence of our souls. What if something happened that God was not expecting and it threw off all of his plans? What would that say about our eternal life? Could his promises be thwarted because he didn't know what was going to happen? What about the threats that he makes to, ungodly, to the ungodly? Could something happen to show that God was inadequate in his judgment? Could he even be a competent judge? We're talking about an eternal judge here. Wouldn't that throw his judgment into question? How could Moses then say in Deuteronomy 32, 4, the rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright he is. See how Moses equates the unchanging nature of God with his justice. Contrast that with the judgment that we, we do and we receive here on earth. We know that it is imperfect justice. In our legal system, we have innocent until proven guilty, right? Well, that's what we're supposed to have, right? Why? Because we don't have all the facts. We don't have all the knowledge. It is presupposed that the judgment may be wrong, so we have to assume the person is innocent before we proclaim guilt on them. But the thing is, all of these consequences that we've just considered of how dangerous, how catastrophic it would be if God did not have all knowledge, we can stand secure knowing that God does have unchanging knowledge. And this makes him the most perfect, the most trustworthy judge. His promises will stand because nothing can surprise him. He knows all your secrets. You can't hide from him. When he judges, it's the most perfect judgment. There is none who can turn around and say, God's not fair. God has put in everything into the equation. We can stand secure in his perfect judgments. We can be confident that nothing will or can surprise or distract him. He knows all. We can trust what he says in his word. We can trust in his promises. And we are walking by faith when we trust in who God is. Thirdly, we see that God does not change his mind. He's unchanging in his will and purpose. What he desires, he does. And he will not change from it. We read in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and he will not do it? Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? God will not. God cannot change his mind. From all of eternity, his mind is made. 
It means if we were to push our thoughts as, as to the furthest point into eternity that we possibly could, God has already, from eternity past, made his purpose for that time. So we can stand secure knowing that God's plan is in place today. Everything that is happening, everything that will happen, is going according to God's eternal plan. God's perfect plan. When things are, uh, are going bad and things are difficult and we're going through trials, we can lean on God knowing that he is in control of those circumstances, of that situation. We can walk by faith and trust in him. It's not a surprise that it is happening. It is not outside what his desires will be. We read in Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What he has decided will come to pass. It is fixed in stone. And this is where the immutability of God touches on his sovereignty. But we may consider, how does this work in, in time? How does this work in, in real time as it affects the here and the now? Does God experience change when he acts? Did he experience change when he created? Did his person, desires, or will change in this, in this action? When we see God perform any action within time, we are not to see that God himself is, is changing in his being or his person or his will. It's rather a change happening to the creation. For instance, in the act of creation, is the creation that has changed. It was brought from non-existence to existence. In this action, God did not become tired, though he rested. He did not become weak. He did not diminish nor did he become greater for it. He remained the same. His will remained the same. At no point did God on a whim decide that he was going to create. He didn't simply say to himself, hmm, maybe I'll create today. He had always planned to create when he created. It was always his plan from eternity past. And this is the same with the fall. No change was made to God when humanity fell. He didn't even become angry. His plans or desires ultimately didn't change. The creation once again is the thing that was changed. The relationship between God and man changed, not God. See, God has always been just and has always detested sin. So when the conditions were met, and so in the fall that is, the creation would feel those aspects of God's person and character that they once had not, uh, were not aware of, at least experientially. Again, this is the case when we see God describing, uh, being described as repenting. This is not an action that God can do. God can't repent. It would go against his unchangeable nature. The only way that God could repent is that he didn't know what was going to happen. He would be surprised. Yet we know that God knows all things. His knowledge cannot change and he cannot learn. There's no need for God to change his mind. He already had the perfect knowledge in that situation. So when we read in Exodus 32 verse 14, and the Lord relented, and in some translations it says repented, from the disaster that he had spoken on bringing upon his people. So scripture says he repented. What, what are we to take of this? This is an example of God using our own language for us to better understand him. It is him coming down to our level and speaking to us. For instance, last week, last week we heard about the mighty hand of God. Are we to understand that God has hands when we read this phrase? No. God is spirit and has no body. It is like when we kneel in front of a child and explain something to them. Would we use the same language when we speak to a child as we would to a friend or a co-worker, people 
our, our own age and our, our own abilities. No, of course not. We change our language and we come down to their level. So it is with God towards us. He comes down to our level so he can explain himself to us. When God repents, he's acting according to his foresight. And at the time that was experienced by the creature. It's the same when God is described as having emotions. God does not become angry. He does not move from a state of adoring love to blinding rage. It is the creature, again, who changes before the unchanging God. So the righteous experience his love and his affection. And it is the wicked that experience his anger. It is more like moving from one room to another room. God's anger is on display. And if you're in this room, you can't see it or you can't experience. You may be able to see it and vice versa. It is the creature that moves from one to the other. When God saves a person, it is not a change to his will. It is God changing the creature. So brothers and sisters, no, this means that God cannot become angry with you. Nothing you can do can make him angry with you and cause him to go off into a blinding rage at you. You're in his love. Now, at times, he may discipline us and that love may sting. You should never have to fear the anger of God. But any friends who are in here who do not know the love of Christ, who are outside of Christ, you may know at the moment his long-suffering patience. But if you remain in that state, all you will know is his anger. Finally, understanding that God is unchanging. We often don't connect this to the Son, to the third person of the Trinity. For the Son shares in the same essence, and he possesses the attribute of immutability. We read in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years have no end. I hope that sounds a little bit familiar. We started with that verse. It's a quotation from Psalm 102. But in the book of Hebrews, we see, if we, if we were to back up in the book of Hebrews, we look at verse 8. We see that the author of Hebrews is applying this to Christ, to the Son. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, that seems to be a pretty tremendous change. For God to take on flesh. For the second person of the Trinity to become a man. Now, this really leads to one of those great mysteries. And while we may be able to give some of those answers, it really points to how incomprehensible, how we cannot truly understand the nature of God. What we do, what we can understand, that no change happened to the second person of the Trinity. In the divine nature of the Son when he became incarnate, when he took human nature, it is part of what is called the hypostatic union. This is the union between God and man, the human nature and the divine nature of of Jesus. So when God became man, these two natures existed together. But they were not mixed. No new nature was created. They remained separate When God took the form of a servant, he did not lose the form of God. He did not become a half God. He did not become a demigod. He remained truly God. Yet at the same time, he was truly man. When he took the form of a man, his divine nature was not lessened. It did not get turned down. He did not lose his almighty strength. His all-knowing wisdom, but he placed a veil over it. 
How much does the sun lose its brightness, the sun in the sky? How much does the sun lose its brightness when a cloud passes before it? It doesn't lose its brightness at all. It's just our perception of the sun. This is the level of change that the sun, the S-O-N, sun, experienced when he became incarnate. He was veiled by, a crowd, by the cloud. Christ remains the same with the veil of humanity over him. And this is what makes him the perfect and sufficient mediator. The place where God and man meet together is in the very person of Jesus Christ. The union between God and man is found in Jesus Christ and it will continue for all eternity. We read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. One day we'll be able to see him in the person of Jesus Christ, but somehow that veil be lifted from, that eye, from our eyes. We'll be able to see the glory of the Son that he's had from all eternity. And that too was always God's plan from the beginning. So my brothers and sisters, this, this is where our worship should bloom from. This glorious eternal truth, which we cannot truly, properly comprehend, must lead us to humbly worship and adore our God. We can come to our God, our mediator, and bring our petitions before him. He will not change his mind. He's not fickle. It's not like he will some days grant some petitions and some days he won't just on a whim. It's not luck of the draw when we come to him. We can be certain if we ask according to his will, he will 100% definitely grant it. And we are guaranteed to receive what we have been asked, what we asked. We also know that he will not go back on his promises. When he promises eternal life, he promises eternal life. He won't change his mind about that. No, we have a solid rock to stand on, to trust. And so we show our dependence on the unchangeable God when we come to him in prayer. When we ask for help. When we ask for help, who do we go to? We go to somebody who's able to help us. We don't go to somebody less able to help us. A child will go to, go to their parents when they need help with something. Why? Because they know that they, their mum or their dad may be able to fix that problem. They show their dependence on their parents. Same is true when we go before God because we are dependent on him. We know he is able to help us. We know that because of the promises made by God, though the whole world may crumble, though the heavens may be torn apart, the church will stand. The promises made to the church will stand forever. Stand on the immutable word of God. And we don't have to be unsure about where we stand before God. If we are in Christ, we do not have to appease him. We don't have to go and do acts to make him happy with us. Because of the sacrifice of the son, he is already happy with us. We stand as prized subjects in the kingdom of God. But if you are outside of Christ, if you have not put your faith in the God-man for the forgiveness of sins, there is certainty that you will receive the wages of your sin. And the wages that he has promised is eternal destruction, eternal death. It is us, the creature, that needs to change because God cannot. You must come to him and trust that he can take away your sin. Jesus Christ has promised to take the sin of any who would come and put their faith in him. And this promise is as immutable as his character. It will not change. This was true when God promised it back then, and it is true now. Those who have trusted in Christ's perfect sacrifice have been sealed for all eternity. He's promised to never leave or forsake us. His promises are not like the promises that we make to each other. I mean, how, how many of us have made a promise that we've gone and broken? 
I know I have. I can say with certainty that you all have. I mean, how many marriages have been destroyed? How many children have been left disappointed? How many deadlines have been missed? How many, you fill in the promise, have not been fulfilled? But God never breaks his promise. Brothers and sisters, this is where we need to learn to imitate God more. We need to be like him. Now, while we can never perfectly imitate him, considering how different we are to him, considering that we are creatures and he is creator, we so often lack in our knowledge and our emotions change from time to time and we're so fickle. Again, I'll, I'll have to quote Stephen Sharnock when he talks about how changeable the human being is. He says, we will be as John today to love Christ and as Judas tomorrow to betray him. And by an unworthy levity, pass into the camp of the enemies of God, resolved to be as holy as angels in the morning, when the evening beholds us as impure as devils. How fickle we can be. We can think that we will promise that we will be better tomorrow. By the end of the day, we're back where we were. We are so inconsistent in our practices. We need to look more like him. We need to be constant and unwavering. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is to be in regardless of what we do, whether it is to be as a godly husband or a godly wife, or as a, as a teacher, as a student, one working for another, one above others as a, as, a, as a boss, as a child, or as we age. We are to show our unwavering allegiance to him in all that we do. In all that we do, we must be steadfast and always abounding for the work of the Lord. We must fix ourselves onto the Lord. When we are not fixed and rooted in God, we are prone to wander. We are prone to enter spiritual apathy. How many times we find ourselves neglectful of the Lord because we haven't put the time and effort into it. We are to find our ultimate joy in Him. He is our greatest love and our joy. All things around us will fade away. We cannot put any ultimate trust in anything we have else around us. We can't trust our riches. We can't trust our health, our friends, our family, our circumstances our own wisdom or strengths, all of these things, any one of those things could change in an instant and we could have nothing. All of these could be lost. We have no security in these things. It is only in the unchangeable God that we can find security. We worship a truly amazing God. He is so alien so strange compared to us. And the more we understand him, the more we realize how different he is to us. And I hope, and I know this is the case for myself, and I hope it is for you, the more we will desire to know him. The God we worship is truly incomprehensible. We cannot truly understand what it means that he does not change. That he is the immovable rock we can stand on. So let us be immovable in the pursuit of the knowledge and love of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can stand on your unchanging promises. That you are before us, showering us with your unchanging love unchanging mercy we pray that you would change us to be more like you that we would love and adore you all the more 
Help us to seek you. We pray that you would help us to work for you steadfastly. We pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen.